Thank you, it's been great to be with you. <laughs> um, well, good afternoon. I'm up north, you're supposed to say good afternoon back to me. Down south, I expect them not to say anything. So, good afternoon. <laughs> Wonderful. Nice to see you all. Nice to be here in Newark and Sherwood. I think it's me making this funny noise because I've got two microphones on for some reason. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is something that is, in a sense, irrespective of government, irrespective of changes in the healthcare system, it is an inevitability, and you and I, and everybody in this room, no matter what happens to the rest of the health and social care system, we are the guardians of it. We are the people who are at the front line, who are having to deal with patients and their needs on a day-by-day -day basis. What we have to do is to respond to what we perceive that drive and demand will be within the constraints that the rest of the body politic place upon us. And I'm going to start with stuff you know, that people with long-term conditions take up 70% of cost and activity in the system, that they are responsible for the majority of unscheduled admissions, a lot of consultations in practice. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. And that if you look ahead, that between now and 2050, there's a 252% rise in the people who have long-term conditions. Now, that seems an awful long way off, for those of you who can remember the Beatles' first single, it isn't. <laughs> it's tangible. And if you drill down even further, and this data comes from the examination of 1.7 million patient records in Scotland, and despite rumours, people in Scotland are pretty much the same as we are, <laughs> that the majority of people have more than one condition. That the majority over 65 have two or more. The majority over 75 have three or more. And if you look even further down, that only 19% of patients with COPD have just COPD. Only 14% of patients with diabetes have just diabetes, etc. That's why I say and it is challenging to some of our colleagues, disease-specific pathways are a redundant strategy for the future that faces us. Because the future that faces us are people with more than one and multiple conditions and complex needs. And to pretend that by focusing on just a bit, we can deal with the whole is a Canute strategy. You and I, when we look at people, Oh, I've got this bit. That actually, there's been a rise in the NHS unscheduled admissions of 36%. Where we have a more integrated approach, much better, 1.6%. You and I, when we look around the room, we see people like that. Though if anybody sat next to his green, I would move. <laughs> the health and care system see people like that. And then we get really clever, because we think, actually, wouldn't it be good if we dealt with all those bits separately and put specialist teams over them? Whereas the poor person down here in the house is thinking, how do they make sense of this Monty Python-esque queue of people outside their door dealing with a bit of them when they have the whole? And that fragmented approach for any of you who have studied any of the literature on safety and reliability, a very pertinent topic as we meet today in the aftermath of the Francis report, that where you have a fragmented, fragmented segmented approach like that, that the risk of error is directly proportionate to the number of fragmentations that there are. 
So the only reason it seems to me we don't know about safety and errors and reliability in the community because we just don't measure it. <coughs> there was one study suggesting in a big hospital down south that 24% of their unscheduled admissions were due to medication errors. I don't know if that's been published and it may not be right. But my sense, and those others of you who are clinicians in the room, my guess is your sense too, is that there is the potential, at least. So how do we make sense of the fact that we have this rising tsunami of need of people with multiple conditions? Our limited ability in terms of time, and our ability to maximise the clinical outcomes. Well, fortunately, people have done some of the work. That when you start to create an integrated care team, when you actually, not diluting specialist knowledge, but pooling that specialist knowledge, creating uh, a value-added effect, as the jargon would say, but what that means is that what you bring to the party and what I bring to the party makes a bigger whole. That we know that you can start to make a big change to what happens to people with multiple conditions. And these are the three drivers that if you read some of the literature and you also go to the places who do it best. And you look at the people who really solved some of these issues. Yongshipping in Sweden, Alaska, Netherlands, Giesinger. Tayside in Scotland and you look at what they've done these are the three drivers that are common risk profiling the population to understand what is the probability of them being admitted out of that drops a list of names some people call that list of names a virtual ward but it's a list of names and being proactive with an integrated care team between health, social care, mental health. Making sure you maximise the care for those people bespoke to them. And I've seen some wonderful stories this morning from what's already been happening in Newark and Sherwood about how far you've gone down this line of creating these integrated care teams, of having this risk stratification. <coughs> and the third, which everybody says, oh yeah, we should do that, but actually don't, is maximising the number of people who can contribute to their own management. It's not just that it's a nice thing to do, but there is now overwhelming literature that it improves the hard, measured clinical outcomes for people. And just think about it. The people with multiple conditions, or even any long-term condition, they actually have to look after it themselves for 7,900-odd hours in a year. We fiddle around with it for five or six. Does it not make sense Therefore, to make sure that people in that huge amount of time when they're dealing with it on their own have some knowledge about what to do to detect that things are getting worse, about what to do if their breathing starts to go off or their sputum gets coloured, about what to do if their peak flow starts to reduce. Yes, it does. And I can't think there isn't anybody in this room who, if they had, and maybe they do now, have a, a long-term condition, wouldn't stick their hand up and say, I think I can do something to contribute to why, how I manage my condition. In fact, I want to contribute <coughs> to how I manage my condition. And it will be the Facebook generation who have long-term conditions before long. They will be wanting to bring down the results on their apps. 
They will be wanting to track their HbA1cs. They will be wanting to get knowledge about what their care plan should and shouldn't do. And I have news for you that is not the future. It's here today, 2013, Isla White. And China. And India. And Mexico. And Indonesia. There is no other way, friends, that we can increase the capacity of our healthcare system unless we embrace the users of our healthcare system in the way I outlined to you. That there isn't going to be some economic white horse galloping over the horizon. The tectonic plates of the global economy have shifted irrevocably. We're not going to be where we were. And yet we have that 252% rise, so that's why it is down to us, as guardians of the health and social care system, that ensuring we have a deliberate plan, not just happenstance, but a deliberate plan to maximise the number of people who can co-manage their condition and set about that is your route to ensuring sustainability. So you don't have to just take my word for all this. Some of the literature, it's not exhaustive by any means, but risk stratification does start to do these sort of things. I'm not going to go through them, you can read it. But the point I'm going to make to you is that some researchers make a huge error. They look at just risk stratification alone, or they look at just integrated care alone, or whatever. But actually, when you learn from these organizations to deliver best, it's putting it all together. Just in the same way that we don't segment a person into arms, legs, and what, what have you. Neither do we fragment the systemic response to that. So the three drivers I've given you have to be all together. Integrated teams, intuitively you think it must be right. Thankfully, people have already proven that it is right. That, that care approach and all you need to do is listen to the stories such as I heard this morning and I hear when I go around the country of the difference where each person brings their specialist knowledge to bear in a bespoke way on an individual patient the contribution the physiotherapist can make or the community matron or the community geriatrician. And that pooling of expertise, that pooling of specialist knowledge is what makes the difference. And self-management, it does reduce the number of people who come see. It does actually do all of these things. And when you read that list, you think it's a no-brainer. It is. So let's just do it. And as I said, there's other literature. People say, and I've had this challenging questions. Well, this risk stratification is all very well, but I know my patients. I know who that list is without any of these gizmos. Oh, yeah? Well, actually, 20% of the patients who appear on this list wouldn't appear in any other way other than that you did that formal analysis. That improving access to those people, that 20% actually improves their care. That every practice I've come across who's embraced this is constantly surprised by the people who pop up. And it impacts on the system as a whole. Huge random, for those of you who get off on randomized control trials, huge one that's showing that reduced inpatient days, reduced A&E visits, reduced readmissions, 
And there's 16 other studies I could have quoted coming up with the same sort of things. Well, that's all very well, you say, but would it work here? Well, let me give you a little bit of hope that if you put together what you're already doing now, and I said to your colleagues this morning that you were in the top decile of CCGs for implementing this. And sometimes when you're working really hard on a project, it's difficult to step outside and see where you are. But you should all be proud of what your CCG is achieving here with colleagues in social care and community service providers and the FT, everybody working together to create a difference because it is the cumulative effect that makes the difference. <clears throat> Status quo is not an option. It's no good your FT saying we can't do this because of the economics. Actually, I say to them, you have to do this because of the economics. It's the other way around. This is what's driving the economy of your healthcare system. But more than the economy, it's actually, do we wish to be in a position where people are zipping in and out of a hospital if you have relatives who've ever been in that position, you know the trauma that that means to them, to their families. We have to intervene in this revolving door. And if you put in place these things, then it does start to change. So just let me give you a feel for what's happening na nationally. You were part of the development program that my team operated. And we asked people, you and CCGs covering 30 million of the population in England. And each of them was providing milestones as to where they were. So if we look at this, milestone three, all practices have implemented it across everywhere. And I show you across the whole country that right now, as we exist, 20% to there, another 60% by the end of this quarter, I think it is. So we'll have 70 odd percent of 30 million patients covered by risk stratification and we kicked off two years ago. It's one of the fastest large-scale changes things I've been involved in whilst all this noise has been going on because like you, people recognize that what makes a difference is doing things for the people you care for. Integrated care teams, here again, across all populations, smaller number because it takes a lot longer, 11%. You're in the 55.9% until next week. And then you pop into the others, but there's a whole host of your colleagues. So close, shortly we'll have 66% of that 30 million population covered by integrated care teams. And this is people who've done it a little longer, and I've chosen this because you used the Devon profiling tool. And these were the guys who created it. And they're showing you the decline. And this is not regression to me, because that's the other thing, you know, oh, it's regression to me. This was a rolling average measurement, which means you eliminate regression to me, which means this is actual. And we wanted to change the financial model to reinforce that care model. And some of you may know that in COF, in the contract that's been proposed, that these three drivers are in there. Risk stratification involved in multidisciplinary team planning and care planning. And there's also this thing called the year of care capitation tariff, which I've been talking about this morning, which is instead of PBR, admitted ka -ching. we actually say to providers in community and secondary care, we're going to pay you for a year of care for this group of the population, high, medium, low risk, and we'll put a price and a tariff with that, but we expect you to include everything in there, but actually here's the hook. You're not going to manage it unless you start to cooperate and work with each other. And there's a huge drive that for people with multiple conditions, that 
will replace PBR. And we're shadowing with some health economies this year and it will become available hopefully from April 14. So as my grandmother used to say, the future isn't what it used to be. But it is what you make it. And what you are beginning to make here with one of your integrated care teams on this second row is a fantastic future for your citizens. So I praise you for where you are and I deeply encourage you to carry it on because they will be forever grateful for in place right now. Thank you very much.